Welcome to the Private Practice Startup Podcast, where we help ambitious private practitioners across the globe to brand themselves and grow their dream practices. We chat with successful private practitioners, business coaches, and marketing experts, bringing you tons of practice building ninja tips. Visit privatepracticestartup.com for awesome resources, attorney approved private practice paperwork, and our signature marketing e course. Here are your co hosts, Dr. Kate Campbell and Katie Lemieux. Hey there, Startup Nation. Welcome back to our Up Close and Personal mini series. We are so excited that you guys are here. And if you're brand new to us, what a fun time to join and discover our podcast. And we hope that you continue to stay and become a lifelong listener. And of course, if you're a loyal listener, welcome back. We really hope that you guys are enjoying this mini series. And the Up Close and Personal mini series is all about you guys choosing the practice builders and coaches that you want us to interview. So we had a great time doing this last time, and this is our second round. So today you guys chose to have us interview Joe Muirhead. So I don't feel like Joe needs an introduction, but you guys might because you might not exactly know her just yet. Um, so Joe Muirhead is all about connecting people to purpose through inspiration and innovation. Um, she's the author of the Entrepreneurial Commission and creator of the Book of Evidence. She's also the founder and CEO of Purple Co., a team of specialist allied health consultants dedicated to helping people who experience injury, illness, and trauma reclaim their lives through work. Joe graduated from the University of Sydney with a Bachelor of Health Science Rehabilita- Rehabilitation Counseling. That's a tongue twister. And 94, Joe is passionate about the health benefits of work and truly believes that everyone has the right to meaningful and rewarding employment. Purple Coral grew out of this belief as a truncated form of purpose for people. So before we start to get up close and personal with Joe, where we put aside the business talk, although we can't always do that, I'm sure we'll talk about business. Um, I just wanted to say, if you're brand new to us, we have a gift for you. Um, We would love for you to head over to privatepracticestartup.com. And whether you like it or not, um, if you're a US-based therapist, you definitely need paperwork. We have a free um, paperwork course for you that goes over everything that you guys need to have in the consent. And it comes with our attorney-approved customizable HIPAA form for free as well. So head over to privatepracticestartup.com and head on over to the resources tab. And there you'll see the free paperwork course. Hey, Joe. Wow, that's a lot of words. I'm sitting here. <laughs> wow, that, that is so profound. I don't think you guys were that polished when we first did an interview together. Wow. That's Probably really- not because we've evolved over the yeah. four years. Actually, Kate, we missed our anniversary of the 6th of June. Today's the 10th of June. Oh, that we're recording. We did. Actually, the 11th for Joe, which is interesting because she's an Australian and yeah. 14 hours ahead of us at this point. Um, so, yeah, we're in two different, like, I think about that as like time travel. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, as you can see from my, well, people listening, we had this massive light coming through the window, the natural light. So it's a beautiful day tomorrow, just in case you're all interested. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. It's so good to have you on for this series. And we'd love to be able to just have you start. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your childhood. Tell yeah. us a little bit about who you are. Oh, okay. Um, so my name's Joe, which is actually the shortened form of Joanne. Don't call me that. I won't respond. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, My parents decided to name me after a Michael Michael Nesbitt song. And Michael Nesbitt was a songwriter for this band called The Monkees. Do you remember? Does anyone remember The Monkees? I'll say, oh, we're The Monkees or something. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, which is really, that's a bit of a fun, fun story for me. So um, I, I grew up in suburbia. I have, uh, I'm the eldest of three. I have two younger sisters. I was a crafty, arty, musical kid. I played a lot of sport. Uh, I was a fairly intense kid. Uh, did a lot of things intensely. <laughs> um, and when I was about 17, I had this real um, sense that I wanted to make an incredible difference in the world. Didn't know what that looked like, didn't know what that meant. Uh, I had, you know, you have stuff and baggage that you bring with you from your family of origin. I've got the same, I've got stuff and baggage because, you know, I think it's a part of the human experience. Not trying to minimise it, just not going there. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I just, um, 
yeah, so then I, I discovered a love, I, I just love people and been fascinated by, by work and, and what work brings us. I've been working since I was 14. Uh, it was an important part of my family. My, my parents uh, had a, a business, they didn't do that very well. So I basically adopted the philosophy of do the opposite of what my father did and my business should succeed. That served me well. <laughs> uh, and he and I did have that conversation before he died, so I don't feel like I'm, I'm being disrespectful to him. I love to travel. I've always been interested in travel. Uh, I was an exchange student when I was 16, so um, I got to go to New Zealand, and Australia and New Zealand are not the same country. We don't even speak the same language. <laughs> so what that, do that the was people, pretty, um, What do people yeah. from New Zealand speak? They speak English with a, with a very different accent and it just <laughs> takes takes a while for you to, and we, we often joke about that. So they will say things like fish and chips, um, let's go to number six. Uh, I'm probably bastardising their accent right now. But, yeah, we often joke about our Kiwi neighbours a lot and we need subtitles. Your Kiwi <laughs> neighbours, right. explain that. Uh, so a kiwi, ah, that's a good question. Kiwis are a animal or a little bird native to New Zealand. They are ground-dwelling birds with a really long beak. And, um, yeah, that's kind of a national symbol of New Zealand, along with the silver fern, which is obviously a plant indigenous to New Zealand. There you go. So <laughs> it's a little so, bit of social anthropology and culture for us this morning. <laughs> kiwi in the States for us is a fruit. Oh, oh, the kiwi fruit. Yeah, it's kind of fuzzy on the outside, brown and green on the yeah. inside. And if you don't get them ripe enough, they're very tart. Uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago, Joe, about that you first started working when you were 14. What was your first job? <laughs> oh, I've done a few things. So I, um, I worked in a, a 1960s replica hamburger joint. Uh, where I became very proficient with deep frying uh, and cleaning, <laughs> cleaning, a lot of cleaning. I was a, a receptionist for a solo operator chiropractor. I did that for a lot of years. That, I was a really good job. I really enjoyed that. Um, I've worked, I did a lot of work in bookstores because <laughs> I love to read. So I funded myself through most of my university working part-time in retail bookstores. Um, yeah, that would be my first time. You asked for one. There you go. You've got three. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, I have to comment on you because I often see your, your post on Facebook for books, book recommendations. And I think I've read two or three of the books that you recommended and I've loved them. So thank you for those random posts um, <laughs> letting us know what you're reading. And I'm like, oh, if Joe likes it, I'll probably like it too. <laughs> oh, nice. So what are, what are you currently reading? Uh, right. Oh, golly. So, oh man, wish it wore it up for me. So, uh, I've, uh, for some reason, the last 12 months, I have developed this absolute fascination with how, how European people got through the second world war. Like I'm, and I love, I don't want to read history books cause boring. Uh, so reading it in terms of historical context has been really fascinating. So I'm reading a book at the moment called we need to be brave. Uh, and it's, a, it's a fiction story based on when, Children were shipped out of London <laughs> to the country in England to keep them safe and what that did for their upbringing and just the amount of poverty and displacement that went on because we all hear about the bombing and, and you know, the devastation of what happened in Great Britain. But just this, this has been a really unique way. So I'll post about it because chances are you'll like that one because it's a very different way of looking at that part of history. Yeah, nice. and the the um the heroine or the main character, she's a really strong, independent woman. Um, yeah, she's very cool. Hmm. Cool. Okay. Before we move on, I just want to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor. When it comes to keeping your practice organized, you want software that's not only simple but the best. We recommend Therapy Notes. Their platform lets you manage notes, claims, scheduling. And they have a new awesome telehealth platform for your online counseling sessions. They offer amazing unlimited phone support and email support. So when you have a question, they are there to help. To get started with the practice management software trusted by over 60,000 professionals, go to therapynotes.com and start a free trial today. Enter promo code PPS as in private practice startup 
and they will give you two months to try for free. Go to therapynotes.com. Tired of never quite feeling comfortable with your private practice financials? I'd like you to meet Green Oak Accounting. Their goal is to empower private practice owners with the financial information they need to make good business decisions. They specialize in working with solo and group private practices in the mental health industry, so they are uniquely positioned to help with figuring out what's normal in your business finances and what's not. So if you've ever had a conversation with your accountant or bookkeeper that left you wishing that they understood private practice or had some best practices to share, head over to greenoakaccounting.com and schedule a free consultation to see if they might be a good fit for you. They can help you with all your accounting needs from bookkeeping to payroll to profit first in budgeting and forecasting. Head over to greenoakaccounting.com now. So speaking of books, what about your favorite business book of all time, if that's possible? (laughs) My favorite business book of all time. Uh, Okay. All time? So the one that I've been coming back to time and time again, it's it's called Grit by Angela Duckworth. Uh, It's it's not how to do business per se. I I guess the how to do the business, there's so many other people who speak into that and there's there's only kind of so many tactics that we can get our head around in terms of do this experience growth, do that experience growth, do that experience growth. Or my fascination has always been around who who do we need to be as people? Who do we need to be? And how do we tap into our innate strengths and what we're good at and turn that into a way of earning an income? My fascination with that is too many of us got stuck in jobs where there was such a conflict of values uh, we go to work, we churn through the people, we churn through the work, we felt like we were doing nothing right, we felt like we were doing nothing properly, we wondered why we were getting sick or depressed. I remember driving to work for months hoping that that would be the day I got hit by a bus because it was just mm. so demoralising and it just felt better to, have to go. If I had a car accident today, I wouldn't have to go and deal with all that stuff. So I, my business book reading tends to be more about who do we need to be as people. We all have the capacity for great good. We can see that we've got the capacity for not so great good. Am I going again? (laughs) No? Okay. Um, So I just, I I want to be reflective and and thinking about that. So Angela Duckworth's book on grit, I I often refer to it. It's on my desk all the time and there'll often be things in that that I I see. Did she also do a TED Talk on that? Because I've seen it. Okay. Very cool. And so as you're reading these books and really just kind of like fascinated about who do we have to be, how does that resonate with you and who you have to be as a leader in this community? Huh. Well, that's a question. (laughs) That's a very thoughtful question. I take, I take my influence really quite seriously. I I probably didn't realize how much influence I had until, till this year. Um, And I know that I could be opinionated. I know that I can offer people a lot of certainty. Uh, So I take my responsibility to make sure that my opinions are well thought out um, based in facts as much as we can or based in my own lived experience. And I think that's the, the key message from the reading that I've been doing over the last couple of years is the importance of incorporating lived experience into what we do. As, as a health professional and now as somebody who wants to empower other health professionals, I just I, if, if we don't look after ourselves and learn how to be who we need to be, we're not going to be able to last the distance to do the work. And it continues to terrify me at how quickly we burn out with l- and the limited amount of support there is in employment, especially for newly graduated cr- clinicians. Um, it, three years is just not long enough to call yourself an experienced clinician. I, I, and people are just leaving the industries, completely leaving. So we're losing all of this knowledge and we're not adding to the body of knowledge. And that's possibly why it feels like we're not actually making gains or advances and why we're still talking about things like we need to eat well, we need to sleep, and we need to drink water. Like, it's, And I'm not trying to be patronising. What I'm trying to say is like, we've got to take this message really seriously because if you don't know who you are, then how, how on earth can you maintain yourself to last the distance and just go mm-hmm. on hand to mouth with the next session, the next session, the next session and not thinking about this 
you're not doing yourself any favours and, and actually you're, you're making all, making us all look bad because you're, you, chances are you're not going to be able to last the distance. I don't want that for you. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel really strongly about it, <laughs> as you can tell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so what are some of your best suggestions about that and how clinicians really need to care for themselves besides the basic stuff that you're saying? Like what yeah. makes you get on your soapbox about it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so running after the tax, so we go, people freak out when they haven't got enough business. Like I haven't got enough referrals, I haven't got enough referrals, so I'm going to spend all my money on learning this next marketing plan and this next tactic and this, I'm just using this as an example. Without understanding that what they've done is actually gone right to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and going, I don't feel safe. So when we don't have enough money to pay our bills, we don't feel safe. So then we start engaging in other behaviours that try and make us feel safe but actually don't fill that void. So then what we start to see happen is all of these health professionals, and it's not just mental health professionals, I see it with speech pathologists, I'm a, basically you name it, I've seen it. GPs, um, nobody's immune to this. So we go into this place of being really fearful and let's say I'm going to take every client that comes through my door and then we start seeing a sliding scales of ridiculous $20 come see me uh, because that'll put food on my table for a day or whatever it is so we get wound up in all of this fear and scarcity and then once you're in that cycle it's really hard to get out of it because if you have taken all these people on really low fees and you don't interrupt that pattern for yourself you're just going to keep perpetuating that problem again and again so if you're going to get really clear about what you want from your business, I want to make 100 grand a year, great, why? And is that actually enough for you to live on? Because I would argue it's not if you want to fund retirement. I would argue it's not if you were the sole income earner for your family. And I'm not saying this to be judgmental, I'm just using it as a very practical example. We all need income to live. Mm -hmm. and we have chosen to serve people in a very unique way to receive income in exchange for our knowledge and skills and expertise. So it's not about charging a heap of money. It's not about who can charge the most for per session. It's about what do you need? What do you need this business for you to do right now? And then what do you need it to do in five years' time? So I, one of the questions I ask every new coaching client is how old will you be in five years and what did you expect your life to look like by then? So this gorgeous woman do a consult with me. I worked with her for a couple of months. She was 72 when she came to me and she had no retirement savings, no plan, and she was completely, she's seen 20 clients a week. Wow. And she was doing tough work. And I asked her that. That's where she got unstuck. And I said, where do you want to be in five years' time? Because she, And she just went, I, I, can't, I haven't got five years in me. Mm -hmm. I haven't got it in me. And I just, I don't want that for anyone else. <laughs> I, lo I love how you're talking about this, Joe. And, and I want to um, ask you just in terms of your own relationship with your business, what, what is your mm -hmm. why and what you want to see from your business now mm -hmm. in terms of how you yeah. want it to look now and then where you want it to be in five years okay so pur purple co so there's kind of a, i've got a few income streams so purple co is my my multi-clinician practice that that business is currently funding my lifestyle allowing my husband and i to put other uh wealth creation strategies in place which for us is real estate at the moment okay but in time five years time probably I would like Purple Co. well on the way to being a business that can operate without me that continues to fund our retirement. Okay, mm. now I say that because my husband is 17 years older than me, so by the time he is 70, we would like to not have to work full time. Okay, mm -hmm. the coaching, consulting, authoritative stuff that Joe Muirhead does, I actually I do that because I love it. It's not the thing I have to do. It's certainly not the thing that makes me the most money <laughs> but it, it it gives me an incredible sense of purpose in being able to help other clinicians be able to last the distance and do the work and do it well do it with incredible satisfaction knowing that they've then gone and helped a whole heap of people who have helped a whole heap of families that have helped a whole heap of communities so this is the way I wanted to be able to change the world when I was 17 this is the mechanism by which I can do that
Mm. So that, that's what gets me up and going and doing the things even when I just want to go back to bed and pull the do not or the duvet over my head and say it's not today. <laughs> <laughs> because so this is up close and personal, I wanted to shift over to your relationship with your husband. Tell us how you met your husband and a little bit about him. Cool. So this is my second marriage. Well, it's the second marriage for both of us. Uh, we actually met in church, which was fun for, for both of us and, and unique. Um, but, yeah, so we've been married almost, oh, golly, no, 10 years next year. Phew. I'm like, whoa, did we not celebrate that? <laughs> you know, bushfires, COVID, cancer diagnosis. Um, so, yeah, that, that's been an interesting learning for both of us. He has um, his first family. He has adult children. He has seven grandchildren. I have one adult child. He's awesome. I didn't need to go back and have any more. He's so cool. Um, yeah, so it's been a, a lovely relationship, I think, for, for both of us. It, it, we didn't actually leave our first marriages going, that's it, I'll go find someone better. It was kind of like, oh, well, this could work. Well, this is nice. And then you get together and then you're like, oh, crap, there's so much stuff I've got to unlearn now. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before, before we dive into more questions about your husband and relationship, I just want to take a break for our second sponsor. If you're looking for a new source of income or wanting to supplement your current work, BetterHelp.com is a great option. BetterHelp allows you the flexibility to choose your caseload size and schedule clients at your convenience. Every day, thousands of people seek the help of licensed therapists at BetterHelp. If you're a licensed therapist or psychologist, BetterHelp is the easiest way to apply your clinical expertise online. With BetterHelp, you can focus 100% of your time on counseling, no need to deal with finding referrals, business operations, managing insurance, or billing. They handle it all. Visit betterhelp.com slash PPS, as in private practice startup, to complete a brief application and get started today. That's betterhelp.com slash PPS. What is your husband's name? I don't think I know his name. Hmm. My husband's name is John Drury, so we don't share the same surname, which confuses his family a lot, but I'd already changed my surname a couple of times, and I'm not doing that again. <laughs> that's, hard it. Work for, that's hard work for women. <laughs> jo, you, I know, right? With all the, yeah. You alluded to uh, um, some of the, the big events that have been happening over the past year that have been really stressful, the bushfires, covid cancer diagnosis. Tell us a little bit about how life has been going with with the heavy, um, very stressful situations that you guys have had to navigate. Yeah. So we're in June 2020 right now. So November 2019, my husband was diagnosed with a bladder cancer and then we navigate and he's fine he's recovered really well from that we just got to do the six monthly monitoring on all of that in december of 19 we had massive bushfire crisis here it was it was terrifying communities were completely decimated um we just smelled smoke for weeks still makes me feel queasy um, then we actually had massive flooding here which was not great for people that were living in tents so though the fires definitely got put out, but then we've had all these people that uh, have displaced communities in tent tents and, and other you know, in in rural and remote. So eighty percent of Australia's population live on the coast, but where most where a lot of the affected people were is like two hours inland. So there's not a lot of resources. It's not easy to just click your fingers and go, let's put the electricity on or let's get internet up and running. Like this is a huge country, but we're all just squished into the places that we like. Then COVID hit. And what was interesting for us with COVID is my husband was at the end of his chemotherapy. So we had just we'd been self-isolating before COVID hit. And the week my husband went in for surgery, I was actually diagnosed with breast cancer as well. Mm. So that was just kind of another slap on the other side of the cheek mm -hmm. for, for me. And um, that happened, that diagnosis happened in, in February. I had some surgery in April and we're still working out what the best treatment plans are for me, which I hope is not this stupid drug that I'm on at the moment because it makes me feel sick. But anyway, wow, 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 wow. Um, so how, how have we coped through all of that? I guess... <laughs> We have we have faith, so I don't know how people get through this without faith in something bigger 
um, I know for me, if, if this whole experience doesn't end up having some sort of bigger purpose, I could fall over in a minute and go, what's the point? Mm -hmm. uh, I have found it incredibly difficult with my own health being so, li my, my wellness is limited. So I don't have full-time work in me. I haven't had full-time work in me since April. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, um, I've had to learn how to do the do the tasks that only I can do and mm -hmm. learn how to delegate effectively because delegating is not just dumping a task on someone. I've had to give up time frames. I don't do smart goals anymore. I think I actually think in this current climate smart goals are a bit redundant. So I don't manage time anymore. I manage milestones. So when when a specific project is finished, then we move on to the next project. And I've taken all the pressure and sense of failure off. I don't know about if you ladies do this, but if I don't meet a goal in the time frame, I kind of feel a bit of failure and a bit of shame. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So I got rid of that because that was not helping me. So now it's like uh, I will set things into the future because I think we need to have some future focus. But I, I'm very much about, no, well, I can't commit to that. And if people try and impose time frames on me, I'm like, I just won't commit. It's like, like I said to you girls, I said, um, I'm really happy to do this, but if I have to cancel the morning of, please don't hate me. And you were like, we would never hate you, that's awesome. But um, it's, it's, just, it's just what my life is at the moment. Um, yeah. Does that answer some of that question for you? Well, it like it's interesting because I was going to ask, like, you know, how have you prioritized life through this mm -hmm. and, like, what has it brought in perspective? And I just, you answered that perfectly. And it's interesting, like, the mindset shift between the deadlines to the projects. And as you say that, I think, like, for me and Kate, too, I mean, we, we've had a very interesting nine months mm -hmm. um, here. And that kind of started with a hurricane threat that, thank God, never hit us. It was supposed to be a Category 5. So we we were in the middle of launching and we had to reorganize all of that. We're getting prepared for Kate's maternity leave. My spouse had medical issues, COVID, and now all of the riots and the protesting and everything going on here. And so it's been very interesting time. And so kind of that bobbing and weaving. And I know Kate and I have really um, over time really have committed to the focus or the follow one thing. And that seems to really streamline those things um, and really is helpful for sure. And yeah, like the, the time deadlines and constraints, they're still there on certain things, but you, you just got to bob and weave and yeah. you're going in different directions and it's all very strange and weird and a lot of stuff is going on for sure. So I love that, that message that you give, of you know, maybe kind of like loosening the reins around the deadlines and just like focus on the project and celebrate that when it's done. You know what I mean? Yes. I'm like, okay, awesome. Now we can focus over here. So I yeah. love that. Hmm, nice. Thank you. That was a, that was a huge challenge for me because I'm a big planner. I often overcommit uh, and then getting to the point where hmm, I have a whole 16 hours that I know I'm going to be good this week. What are the most important things to get done? And mm -hmm. what are the things that only I can do? It totally shifts your perspective. Um, and then when you've got all these other circumstances that are beyond your control, nobody put manage COVID-19 and manage racial unrest in their business plan for this year. So it's not, <laughs> but, but yet here we are and it's teaching us to duck and weave and pivot. It's teaching us that we can get through all of this. It's teaching us how to be community-minded and good social citizens and it's teaching us where we fall short. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to get curious about what this looks like. From, from a historical perspective, like what what change is going to have occurred because of this, because of COVID and because of the attention that's been given to racial divide or any any divide, basically, you're not the same as me, I'm not the same as you. Uh, how did we end up in a space where we're all so scared of each other? Um, mm. I, we could talk about that for a really long time. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on there. So I'm curious because you are such a big proponent of therapists and their own self care and their well being. What is one of your favorite self care things or your how do you spend your me time? 
uh, well, I read. Um, I'm in the garden a lot. Mm. So um, I really, and we've got a beautiful garden here. I live in a national park, so it's it's lovely being outside with the birds and we live in a lovely temperate climate. So that my me time, it, since, since I've become so unwell, I've been doing a lot of crafting and art again, which I haven't done for years. And it's just one of those things I've been able to do that I enjoy purely for the joy of doing it, mm. um, which is an unusual thing for me to say because if something doesn't have a purpose or a plan or an outcome attached to it, then why bother? Now it's like, <laughs> oh, that's pretty. Let's do another one. I'm like, who, who is this? What have you been crafting? Uh, so I have a, a cross stitch that I started. I think Anthony might have been, so probably 15 years ago. They're, they're thing, ornaments that you hang on your, your Christmas tree, so I'm working on getting those done. Um, lots of colouring in, different different books and using different um, medium for colouring in. So I've got pastels and I've got oil crayons and then I've got your normal everyday colouring in pencils. And um, a client of mine had posted a free pattern for this beautiful crocheted blanket yesterday and I'm like, oh, that's my next project. So I'm mm. now, now I've got to, going to get my crochet, my mum's crochet hooks out. So that's going to be fun. <laughs> I'm seeing this beautiful tree behind you and it reminds me of a few years ago you had sent me, I think it was right after we had initially oh, wow. connected on the podcast, yes. this beautiful colored drawing that you had drawn in with colored pencils of a tree for a surprise birthday card. And I remember it, it came in the mail and it looks so different because it came all the way from Australia. And um, whenever I see the tree behind you, it reminds me of that. It's just such a creative and very thoughtful thing to do. Oh, thank you. So the tree symbolizes my word for the year, which is about blooming. Mm. So the, the, the tree, like I've, I've had this spoken over me for many, many years. I'm like that solid tree and people come and find safety and creativity. And then we've got, and you can't see them there, but there's a couple of little birds flying off that have been, you know, leaving the nest and doing their thing. But it's, it serves to remind me that it's not just about me. What I do is never just about me. Um, yes, I'm important because what, uh, and if I'm not solid and the tree trunk and not rooted and grounded, then the branches will wither and not as many people get served. And I don't say that to be arrogant. I say that to go, this is, this is where I've been positioned and this is how I can serve this community because I can't see all the clients. Mm -hmm. I can't see them all. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's it's really cool to understand when you're in like a leadership or supervisory role of being able to touch a few to touch many, mm -hmm. right? Like that extends mm -hmm. out and really how powerful that is overall. And just even when we touch our own clients' lives, the impact and the yes. trickle down effect it has on so many. And that's a really cool, beautiful thing. Joe, I'm curious. Uh, people have some very specific questions for you. Um, and one of them is, how many of your grandmother's teacups do you own? So why don't you tell us about the teacups first and how many do you own? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I don't know. I haven't actually counted them. Um, so the teacups, oh, wow. So my my mum, who passed away 11 years ago, she was collecting these beautiful old uh, bone china teacups. We have no idea why, um, but somehow they ended up in my storeroom so yay me so finally started to unpack them and start looking through them and I was probably I was, I was having a cup of coffee out of each of them going I don't know if any of these have ever been used I was dating them I was finding out all this history stuff about them um, that was a lot of fun and then I was posting about it on Facebook and my cousin who's a little older than me, said, hey, I've got Nan, so she's actually my great-grandmother. She's got, I've got boxes of Nana Lil's crockery. Do you want to come and see if there's anything there that you would like? So I ended up with more of <laughs> these coffee cups and or sets. They're, they're not usually, yeah, there's one, one or two of, of each. And then I remembered that that, that particular great-grandmother, Lillian, when I was little, she gave us all a cup, saucer and plate. And it was just a thing that she passed down from the generations. So I went and found the one that she gave me and learnt the heritage of it and went, hmm, that's it's actually created before the Second World War and how it got to Australia because it's Scottish, I don't know, but it's mine. I uh, thought so I'm going to start that tradition now for the young ladies in my family moving forward. 
So I've been pulling them out, washing them up, working out who's going to go where. And then, yeah, I, I also have a plan to have a bit of a celebration for my mum using them as well. But how many do I have? Mm. Probably 40. Wow. 40, yeah. Oh, no, there's a lot. John goes, are we going to display all of those? What do we need to build to display all of those? I'm like, no, it's okay. We don't need to do that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that was a really fun way to connect back with with my mum and my grandmother and my great grandma and just my my sense of who I am in my family, um, and it's 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 allowed me to have a, a way of talking to other family members about a thing that, that yeah because my mum died in she was killed in a car accident and that's been mm. it's still quite um it makes it hard for people to talk about her and and celebrate her but I now think we've got a mechanism of being able to celebrate her so that's pretty cool. Wow. And you said that's mom or grandma? That's mom. Oh, wow. How long ago was that 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 happened? About 11 years ago. 11 years okay. ago. Wow. <laughs> it's a fun fact about Joe. So my mum was killed in a car accident, which we have no, we don't know why or how. It just is, and that's hard. And then my father was killed, I think, three years ago in a workplace accident, which we have wow. no knowledge about or we don't know why it happened or how it happened it was just he ended up with this massive brain injury that so it's like how how does one one person end up losing both parents in such tragic circumstances 10 years apart it was just like wow wow Uh, and given the work that I do it was like that was mean (laughs) that that's mean Mm. um we can talk about it. We're doing okay. I am just really, I'm just going to give Jill Johnson Young a plug because she has been the person that has helped me manage, learn, and accept my grief and my loss. So, mm. plug for Jill. Yes. It's been an yeah. amazing experience. Awesome. Awesome. So, Joe, I think it's time for us to move into our lightning round where we're going to ask you kind of rapid fire questions, whatever comes yeah. to mind. Oh, let me have a mouthful <laughs> of water. <laughs> We're surprised it's not your second cup of coffee. Yeah, it's coming. It's like 14 minutes away. It's on the <laughs> so that's, that's a perfect uh, rapid fire question. How do you take your coffee? I drink double macchiatos. Uh, Starbucks is not coffee. I'm just going to say that again. Starbucks <laughs> is not coffee. I'm so sorry you have to drink that stuff. You really don't. So double macchiatos, uh, two shots of espresso with a splash of milk. Wow. So what, is, what is coffee then? Oh, it's, What's your favorite coffee? I, it's very difficult. <laughs> That's a really good question. I can't quite go into that right now. I just know every time I come to the US and I'm stuck and the only thing I've got is Starbucks, I am that a really annoying person who goes, now I want you to use that bean in that machine and I need the water at this temperature. Everyone else is going, I want a grande latte caramel type of thing that's not really coffee. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Go back and grind my beans again. <laughs> It's funny because someone had listed the question, is Starbucks really coffee? But you already asked that. So I've got another question for you. Uh, okay. What's your biggest pet peeve? Oh, um, wow. <laughs> How about we'll move on to the next one and then if Listen. that pops up, just we'll come back. No, no, people who listen to respond, not people who are listening for understanding. Mm. So I hate, and I catch, and I guess it's because it's a self reflection. I'm, I'm good at that. I'm always like, let's do this, let's do that. I'm, I know the answer, I know the answer, I know the answer. And now I think with everything that we've got happening all over the world, it's like, no, 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 I need to hear you out first and then I'll respond. And certainly, um, my health experience here in Australia, that my biggest issue, my biggest thing to deal with is feeling like health professionals just don't care. Yeah. Mm. They're, they're great. We're so good in the room when we're doing our clinical thing, but as soon as we leave the room, it falls to shit and I'm really pissed off about that because we can't mm. afford to make people feel crap once they leave the room. Mm-hmm. Anywho, yeah. here we go. Soapbox for Joe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How about your favorite dessert? Tiramisu. And I know that you love bark thins too. I know that's not a dessert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, so I received a box of bark thins. I don't know who from. I think I do. But I get, get this box. But it's come from Kuwait. Well, we, 
Oh, really? Recently? Yes. Wow. Oh, how fun is that? I know we sent you Bark Thins and Sour Patch Kids when you were in Hawaii because you never yeah, yeah, had yeah. Sour and Patch Kids. No, that, that was an experience. <laughs> how, fun, how fun, though, to get some Bark Thins from Kuwait. That's awesome. It's a tiramisu. Yeah. I'm going to ask, uh, we'll ask this last one, and then Katie will ask one last one. What's one thing that you absolutely don't like that other people love? Oh, double macchiatos? Um, <laughs> oh, beetroot. What's beetroot? Oh, beets. You call them beets. Oh, beets, beetroot. Gotcha. Yeah, so we call it beetroot. You know, that red vegetable, horrible, yes, beet, slimy. Ugh. Yeah, I'm with but you on that. Everybody loves beets except Joe, and except for me too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they taste like dirt to me. Yep, I agree. Not nice. They do taste like dirt. The pickled ones are not that bad, I will say. But anyway, um, do you have a birthday tradition? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do tell. It's a devil's food cake. <laughs> okay. Yum. Yeah, yeah, so that's um, that's that that's a birthday tradition that we've held for a very. My mom started that, so mm. that's. Do that's you make really, it, or someone makes it for you? Well, for my birthday, someone will make it for me. For others' birthdays, I will make it. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I know Kate said one more question, but I just have one more. You're okay. going on a holiday. What's the first item that you pack? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> You're what? The power, the power board. Um, you know where you plug in all the different plugs for whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that you makes the electronics work. Yeah. <laughs> so I've learned now that that's the first thing that gets packed. <laughs> gotcha. That's so funny. I thought you were going to say your own like favorite coffee or something like that that you would oh, bring it with okay. you. Okay. Yeah. So Matilda comes with it. <laughs> my co- my coffee machine has her own name. Her name is Matilda. She she does come with, but she's probably not the first thing that gets packed. It would be the power cord. That's really funny. <laughs> That's <priceless. laughs> The first thing that gets packed when I come to the States is Matilda. <laughs> We're so util- utilizing that in the like social media posts as a little teaser or something like that. Who's Matilda and where does she get packed in the suitcase? <laughs> <laughs> so Joe, thanks so much for being such a great support despite everything that's going on. And I know that, you know, our fans, your fans really wanted to hear from you. So it was great to get up close and personal with you and learn a little bit more about you and, just kind of what makes Joe tick and things that we hadn't known already. So we appreciate you for being here. And thank you both for making this happen because it's not necessarily convenient for any of us. Thank you. Time zone changes. <laughs> oh, no problem. No problem. Start Nation, we hope you have an awesome and inspired day. And don't forget to check out the rest of your fan favorites, the ones that you guys chose in the Up Close and Personal podcast series. Um, stay inspired. Take care, everybody. See you next time. Thanks for joining us on The Private Practice Startup. Visit theprivatepracticestartup.com for awesome resources, free trainings, attorney-approved private practice paperwork, and so much more. 